Okay. Well, the other group, the Princeton group, is not here today because they're getting lecture number two on algorithms, and today they're learning about optimization and efficiency, which are the things we're going to talk about from a biology point of view. They're words that have completely different meanings in the different disciplines. So it's very important that you understand biologists when they say, is that an optimal solution? And they need to understand when you say, yeah, my algorithm's efficient and optimal. And if they impute the meaning based on what you're going to learn today, you'll see why the two languages don't intersect. Okay, so we have parallel processing today. So we're going to talk today about population biology and the theory of games and how those two are related. Now, as you can see on page one, I've, talked, I've defined what a population is. Okay, a population is comprised of individuals. And it is individuals that ultimately are responsible for all the dynamics that we are interested in, whether the dynamics of individual actions or inter-individual actions through associations or the aggregation of those inter-individual actions that lead to the dynamics of populations, everything emerges from individuals, which means that ecology and evolutionary biology are blended because what matters in terms of life on Earth is the ability to spread genes into future generations. That is the ultimate definition of success. That's evolutionary success. To do that, you've got to solve problems posed by nature. And so nature throws all sorts of curveballs at individuals in terms of stressful environments and interactions with other types of individuals in the population because no two individuals are the same. And so natural selection is selecting amongst individuals that solve the problems posed by nature best or at least better than any other individual. So keep in mind, it's not that you have to run faster from the lion. You just have to run faster than your neighbor because the lion will eat your neighbor if you run faster than it. Okay, so, so selection is not the best of all possible worlds it is the best relative to what others are doing. Very important to keep that n relative notion in mind because we're not necessarily looking for the best possible solution. We're looking for the better solution than those around you. And figuring out how to design studies to identify that empirically is partly what we're gonna be doing in the course and also to develop tools, mathematical tools, for thinking about what is better than something else. So it all comes down to individuals interacting with their environment. Now the environment consists of physical features and biotic features. And the biotic features can be conspecifics, members of your own species, and members of other species or interspecifics. Now, what type of interspecifics might be out there? Um, lion and gazelle. Okay, so there could be competitors that do something similar to you but not identical to you, and there could be something that eats you which could be a predator or a disease agent, a parasite, that gets you sick. So those are interactions among other species. What's a conspecific? It's a member of your own species. Now members of your own species don't all have to be the same either. What differences are there going to be in terms of phenotypes? Size, weight, coloration. Sex. Gender, age, life stage, reproductive class, dominance rank, boldness, shyness, all sorts of features separate individuals. And one of the conundrums is trying to figure out which of those are important because all those aspects are real. Each of you in the room differ in your ethnicity, 
in the languages you speak fluently, in the left-handedness, the right-handedness, your sex, your skin color. Those are all phenotypic differences, and many of them may not matter because the problem posed by nature is going to be, can be solved in different ways by different individuals, and in some cases, aspects of the phenotype provide the, the tools for the better solution. Okay? So we're going to spend a lot of time when we're out in Kenya looking at individual differences. Okay, I've got to turn this back on. Okay, so let's start with physical fact. Go ahead. Okay. It, it should be back up? Yeah. Okay, so let me back up because it looks like it's smaller. No, it's the same size. Okay. Okay. So we'll start with physical factors. And I've drawn, I've drawn a picture of Africa and I've drawn a picture of a mountain. And I circumscribe certain areas, a circle in Africa and a band on the mountain. And I've written down ranges. So these are usually tolerances. So when you come to interact with nature, you often are restricted where you can go and live. So often it's temperature. So in Africa, I've circled the area around Kenya that is on the equator, has certain rainfall patterns, certain maximum temperature, certain minimum temperature, and certain species can survive there. If they go north at the upper edge of the boundary, they end up in the Sahara Desert, they might not be able to, to live. And so that circumscribes the northern part of their range. The southern part of the range might also be due to temperature or differences in rainfall, but those boundaries are where they can survive and where they can't survive. So that's how they, that's the consequences of their ability to solve problems posed by nature that are associated with physical factors. The same on mountain range, that it gets colder as you go up the mountain, and some species, based on the amount of insulation that they have, the amount of fur, they can only go so far north. So they're restricted in terms of the height at which they can go up the mountain. And similarly, there may be drought and temperature that restricts how low they can go down the mountain into a valley. So there's a narrow band of tolerances given their phenotype, given their physiology, given their morphology. So they might have fur or not fur. They might have fat or not fat. They might be able to evaporate water because there is water to cool themselves. Those tolerances are based on their metabolism and their ability to sustain themselves on those portions of the landscape. I've drawn an acacia tree and I've put some blue dots there. Those are bird nests. And so Carrie and Victor know that some of our students last time were looking at the distribution of various nests of certain species of birds. What factors might affect why those nests are distributed where they are, which is biased and not evenly or randomly distributed on the tree? These are weaver birds. We're going to see lots of them. They must build nests to put their eggs in, but they don't put the nest all over the tree. What might determine why they put the nest where they do? Probably not access to food and water because the birds fly off to feed and bring the food back. They fly off to drink and then they come back and regurgitate to the young. So those two are the, probably not the two that matter. Predators. They're not. Go ahead. Predators? Yeah. What was that? I didn't hear that. Uh, they're not very visible predators. to predators because they... Could, could be predators that they might not want to be close to the bowl of the tree because that's when a predator can reach out and get them. But they might not be able to be all the way out on the edge of the tree because the branches might not be strong enough so the wind could shake them and the eggs could fall to the ground and then the predators would eat them then. Right? So there may be structural features of the tree that let them manage risk differently. So predation is going to be important. But how they solve that predator problem might depend on how old the tree is, how strong the tree is, how many branches that there are in the tree, and whether the tree allows 
for placements in safer places than not so safe places. And if a tree doesn't do that, they might shun that tree altogether. So predation is one factor. What other factors might be important? The shelter. How about? Yeah. What? Sorry. Go ahead. The shelter that the branches might provide to the nests from right. rains so, and weather. Right. Okay. So, so rain, the nests probably are protected because it's a complete nest, so the eggs aren't going to get wet. But heat loading could be a serious problem. And so, if you're too far out, you might get more sunlight than if you're closer in. But now you start to see an amazing problem. The closer you are into the bowl of the tree, you might be protected against heat loading, but then what happens to your risk of predation? It could go up. So you, now you have an inherent trade-off. If you optimize one variable, you might leave yourself open to failure in meeting the needs of minimizing risk, the other variable. If you distribute yourself so that you're minimizing your chance of being eaten, you might get so much sun loading, heat loading, that your young would overheat and they would die. So you can start to see that there may be very few places that let you solve both problems equally well. That's called a trade-off. And biology, population biology, is loaded with trade-offs. So this is one of the issues you're going to come up against when you're modeling systems. When you solve an individual problem posed by nature, it's often straightforward. Trying to simultaneously solve two problems posed by nature may be much more difficult. And that's where individual weightings of those two problems become important. And it may turn out, based on your phenotype, that different individuals weight those variables very, very differently. Males may weight the variables differently from females. Aged females may weight the variables very differently from young females. And so other factors in the phenotype that biologists worry about may enter the problem. So you start to see that what starts out to be very simple gets very complicated very quickly. So this is some warning bells. And when you're talking to biologists, you're going to feel frustrated at times because they're going to complicate the problems and say, but what about this? And but what about that? And you're going, damn, it's going to be harder for me to deal with that. But that's the reality. And so having discussions about what's really important, because biologists will throw at you, like I did at the beginning, many different ways in which the phenotypes can vary, many of which are not going to be important to this particular problem. So you'll need to push back and say, but how real is that? How relevant is that? Or, or, and we, have can to do, or we can do some data mining. <laughs> yep, you can do some data mining, OK? So that's just some examples of how physical factors are important. They're often adjusted by behavior, where you build the nest, where you tend to range. Those are behavioral responses. They are immediate, and they're short term. Make a note of that. But that's not the only solution. There are longer term responses that get averaged over one's life or change at different stages in one's life. And we call these life history adjustments. And in the extreme, we can imagine a world where resource levels are different. So we don't know what it's going to be like in Kenya this January. If it rained in October, November, the world will be green. There'll be lots of vegetation. Lots of vegetation makes the herbivores that eat vegetation happy. It makes the animals that eat insects very happy because the insects are eating the grass as well as the large herbivores. So everything's honky-dory and everybody's happy. If resources are abundant, your responses may be life in the fast lane. Fatten up, make babies now. If, on the other hand, we get there and it hasn't been raining, and the world doesn't have much vegetation, or what vegetation it is is sparse and it's brown, then animals are not going to have a nutritious diet. The insects are going to be low in abundance. 
and you would say that they, the, the universe consists of scarce resources, and animals may slow down their response. They may not invest in reproduction this year, forego reproduction until next year, keep themselves fat, keep themselves alive, so they can play the game next year. These are responses that are much longer range and are not necessarily instantaneous and behavioral. They represent life history adaptations. So all of a sudden, time, speed of the response, the immediacy of the assessment have changed. And at that different scale, the response is going to be a life history response as opposed to an instantaneous behavioral response. Okay, so let's stop there for a moment. Any questions? What do you think of the complexity of the problem? What do you mean by complexity? <laughs> you, you tell me. Number of variables. Okay, so you've got a number of variables. Is that sufficient to define the complexity? Uh, no, no. What else enters into it? How these variables into play. Right, because that's what we... Sort of depend on each other. Right, so the, so the interplay among the variables themselves creates trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And then the interplay between the suite of variables with the different types of individuals in the population are also going to play off each other. So the dimensionality of the problem can be large. And so Tanya raised the point that if we teach our biology students how to data mine, we might be able to find clusters and patterns that would allow us to simplify the problem. Doesn't mean we have the answer to what drives the response and what's leading to the better response than the less good response that natural selection is going to favor. Because remember, the animal that responds best will stay alive, will have the body condition to be able to breed, and will be in good enough condition to be able to keep the babies alive. If the babies stay alive, the genes from the parents will have vehicles to carry those genes into the future. And n generations down the line, the genotype that has the most genes into the future is the winner. That's how natural selection operates. That was Darwin's major insight, that genes are trying to spread themselves into future generations. And those individuals that have the responses that solve these problems posed by nature in their multi-dimensions better than some other individuals will step by step lead to more surviving genes. Now the example I just gave you is an environment that remains constant, that the selection pressure is relentless. Whatever it is, it doesn't change. Now what happens if the selection pressure changes because the environment oscillates? It's hot and dry one year, it's wet and cold the next year, then hot and dry the next year, wet and cold the next year. What do you think is going to happen? Do you think the life history adjustments are going to be the same as opposed to if it's continuous and constant? No, it's going to be very different. Behaviorally, what's favored in the hot and dry might be very different than the behavior that's selected for in the cool and wet, hot and dry. Now, individuals might have diversity of behaviors in their repertoire. We do. Large animals with big brains do because they can remember and they can associate. Ah, strip off some clothes when it's hot and dry, put on a sweater and a coat when it's cold and wet. Right? We can do that. Animals can pile or erect. When it's hot and dry, they can raise their hair to let the heat out, and they can evaporate water to cool. Or they can interlink their hairs, like your down jacket or your down sleeping bag, and trap the air to stay warm when it's cold and wet. So animals, too, have this ability to respond behaviorally. Not necessarily cognitively, but natural selection will favor these flexible 
and contingent responses depending on whether the selection is relentlessly consistent or some way varying and oscillating. Okay? So that's dealing with the physical environment. That type of ecology is called aught ecology. A-U-T ecology. Another type of ecology is called syn ecology, S-Y-N ecology. And that's the ecology that relies on interaction among these individuals. So it's not bad enough that you've got to deal with the physical environment. You then have to cope with other players on the landscape that also are trying to solve problems posed by nature. Those most similar to you in this competition are members of your own species. And that's intraspecific interactions. And intraspecific interactions usually take the form of competition because resources tend to be limited because populations tend to grow until resources become scarce. Ecologists define competition as interactions that are negative-negative. What does that mean? Usually you think in terms of competitors as one wins and one loses. Why do we have two negatives? Why don't we have a plus minus? Because, because the presence of a, of a competitor uh, means that uh, uh, each of the, of the species has limited access to resources because as long as the competitor exists, it's going to take some away. So you broke up, but I think I, I got the gist of it. If there's ten pennies on the table, yeah, as long as, if there's, as there is a competitor if, which, take, which takes at least one, there is less uh, for you. So as long as a competitor exists, even if you are dominating one, you have less than you would if you were the only down. Right. That's it. So if there's ten pennies on the table, and you guys all reach for them. The fact that some of you get some implies that you didn't get all of them. And similarly, even if you got all of them, you would have wasted time and energy and possibly got damaged by jostling everybody and excluding them so you could get all 10 pennies. You paid an opportunity cost at least in terms of wasted time and effort. So since you don't do as well as you could have done if you were alone on the landscape, even if you get all the resources, you've paid a small price. The loser that gets no resources pays a bigger price. So we haven't put magnitudes on the minuses, but co competition, even if you're members of the same species, usually leads to a negative and a negative, but does not have to be equally weighted negatives. So I've written down the standard equation that people use to model competition within a species. And they write the change in numbers of individuals with respect to time is equal to R times N, where R is the species intrinsic rate of increase. Okay, it's something specific to a species. And N is the number of individuals in the population. So if you ignore the term in parentheses, what does that tell you? What would that curve look like? Exponential growth. Over time. I'm sorry? Exponential growth. Exponential growth. So a population will keep increasing. Well, what's going to stop it from increasing? Resource. And something has to stop it. It could be those environmental factors, right? could get all of a sudden a cold snap and a lot of individuals die. So if the population grows exponentially and is driven down, grows back exponentially, is driven down by environmental factors, that's called density independent population regulation. So write that down. Density independent population regulation. So this equation is describing population growth. The graph that describes the sawtooth pattern would be the graph showing the population is being regulated. It's not growing infinitely. Something is keeping it in check. Something's killing individuals. And that something tends to be independent of density. It's due to these environmental factors that we're talking about. 
The drag term that I put in parentheses gives you a different type of population regulation. It gives you population regulation called density dependent population regulation. So the regulation is a function of crowding. And this toy term is a drag term. So if there's no individuals in the population, n is zero, and k represents the hypothetical carrying capacity or the limit to which a population can grow. So if you have no individuals, it's not crowded, just you, essentially you're growing unregulated in an exponential fashion. There's no drag because it's going to be 1 minus 0 or 1. But as the population reaches the carrying capacity, what happens? What's happening to unfettered growth? What's happening to DNDT? Flats out. It gets the saturation. It's going to zero because it's going to be one minus one. So zero times Rn is going to be zero, so you get no growth. So this is called the logistic equation, and it captures the nature of density dependent population growth, and it's an S shaped curve. It's exponential like in the beginning. And then as crowding occurs, it slows it down, pulls it away from the exponential, and turns it so it reaches that carrying capacity. Okay. So that's one species. And I've written below one of the series of equations if it's many species. So now it's dn1 dt equals the intrinsic rate of growth of species one and the number of individuals at any point in time of species one times the drag term, again one, minus that density dependent term. And notice that density dependent term has N1 in it, crowding by self, which is what the logistic equation is about. But it has added to that some other term which converts members of the other species into harmful agents in the units of your own species. And it does it by alpha, that competition coefficient, which is just the relative weighting or equivalence between own species and other species. So if another species can't harm you, alpha is zero. But if the other species harms you on a per capita basis of 50% of your own species, alpha would be 0.5. So the combination then is own equivalence feeding back on your population regulation scaled by your carrying capacity, K1. And that's the interspecific competition. And if it's two species, it would just be the complement, but it would be a series of n of these equations for the n species in the community. OK, does everybody have that so far? So that's competition. Predation and parasitism are plus and minus. One species benefits at the expense of the other. And what I have done here is I have a herbivore, D, D herbivore, change in herbivore numbers with respect to time, and DP, change in predators with respect to time. And your herbivores, are growing exponentially, they have an intrinsic rate of increase in the number of herbivores, but what stops them from reaching their carrying capacity is how they're harmed by the predators. And so that's going to be the product of the number of herbivores times the number of predators times that conversion factor or harm factor, in this case alpha. So that's what's going to eat the herbivores and limit their growth rate. What about change in predators with respect to time? Again, it's going to be a conversion factor of those herbivores that have been eaten minus the ordinary death rate, DP, of the predator. That has an intrinsic death rate. Okay? And so those coupled systems will give you some equilibrium between the number of herbivores and the number of predators in a population. And mutualism is plus plus. It's a combination of the equations that I've shown you before. 
that you do better in the presence of another species than if you're alone. And these then determine the solution to how many individuals of each species can coexist on a landscape. And it can be a stable point, it can be cycles, or it can be chaotic, depending on the magnitude generally of those R's. When life is fast, it tends to be chaotic. When life is slow, it tends to come to a stable point. And when life is intermediate, in the rate at which it happens, it tends to have cycles. Okay? And that is the key to understanding population ecology. The dynamics of the number of individuals and populations and the factors that regulate those. So we can see we have abiotic factors, the environment, problems posed by a physical nature, and biotic factors, problems posed by the presence of other species, wanting the same resources and the same safe sites and the same desire to avoid predators that you do. And those biotic interactions interplay with the physical forces to finally set and control the number of individuals in a population at a particular place, at a particular time, on a landscape. And those individuals are making babies. And those babies are providing demographic stability to the population, but they're also, because natural selection is the factor that's determining who solves this problem of competition or this problem of predation or this problem of cold environments better, is winnowing out the various traits. In some cases, it's going to be the fleetest animal in the population, and others it's going to be the strongest individual that turns around and fights the predator, like a muskox. The best defense may not be running away. It may be standing your ground and fighting. But those represent different solutions depending on the nature of the predator. And we're going to see a lot of that variation when we go out into the field. Uh, so Dan, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, you talked about, um, you mentioned that if the number of the resources in the environment are abundant, then the animal is going to a frenzy of breeding to try to maximize the number of it, uh -huh. um, the Does that influence, uh, does that influence the competition later on? So it eventually, too many it could. Um, That's right, and, and, and that's going to lead back to, that'll, that'll come in, if they're alone on the environment, that's going to come in with this equation right here. Right, it's going to get crowded. And if it gets crowded, then life becomes slow. So populations that are in a crowded world live life in the slow lane, and they're often called K-selected species because they're working at the carrying capacity. Species that live life in the fast lane, that is always lots of resources, tend to be species that are being controlled by the abiotic factors, not the density-dependent factors, but the density-independent factors, and they tend to live life in the fast lane, and they're often called R-selected species because they're unencumbered by this term. They're operating mostly in this region. So you start to see that the life history adjustment, which is the long-term window, depends on the repeated nature of how the population is doing. Okay, so my question is, do they also modulate their um, R factor? Do they modulate their intrinsic? Um, yeah, they do. So, so R, is treated as a given here, but R equals the difference between birth rate and death rate in the real world. And it's that difference between birth rate and death rate that determines whether you're in this R-selected portion of the universe or the K-selected portion of the universe. So when your birth rates are very, very low, it's often a response to a crowded environment because you're not investing in kids that are going to die because they have no space to go. So you invest more in the survival of each kid. So you build a suite of traits that lead to what we call case selection. In a crowded environment, you have fewer kids, 
You invest more in each kid. You make each kid bigger and more competitive, and that slows down the life cycle even more to wait for someone to die so that your kid can duke it out with the other kid to take that one space. Whereas in a world where it's fluctuated because of abiotic factors, there's always open spaces. It would be selected against to make a few big young because they don't have to compete. There's always resources in open space. So you make many feeble small young so that you can take as many of those spaces as possible. And that feeds back on many young, feeble young, rapid generation time, no investment in any particular young, no parental care, just rapid turnover. Okay, and that's called R selection as opposed to K selection. Life in the fast lane versus life in the slow lane. So elephants live life in the slow lane. Humans live life in the slow lane. You know, you're all getting investments to become really bright for those few postdoctoral slots and few academic jobs. Right? You can't ask for a more K-selected universe than academia. Okay? Very different from the rats in the tenement that are living life in the fast lane. Okay? Okay, thanks. I had a question. Um, in the, uh, the, the plus minus equation, where uh, mm -hmm. you had the, the predators uh, as a minus, but would that actually, with the predators eating more of the herbivores, that would have a decreased density population, which would be better? Yeah, I didn't, you notice there's no, there's no density population regulation in here. The species are regulating themselves. You could put in a density on the predator, but I've kept it simple so that the more predation there is, the more birth rate of babies, and if the intrinsic death rate, this DPP term over here, is small, the population of herbivores are going to keep, the predators are going to keep increasing. Okay? Maybe then there'd be crowding. But if they start increasing, what's going to happen to the number of herbivores? It's going to go down. So eventually the herbivores go down, and so you tend to get cycles that as the herbivore numbers go up, the predators' numbers lag behind. The, then the herbivore numbers go down, and the predator numbers go down, and then the herbivore numbers go up, and the predator numbers go up, and then they go down again. That, that equation gives you this oscillation. So you don't really see much density dependence because the herbivores are being limited by the number of, I mean, predators are being limited by the number of herbivores in the population. Okay, so that term right here, this product, is limiting the number of babies being born over here. And when that intrinsic death rate over here is a constant, then this term outnumbers this term, outnumbers this term, and it goes negative. That's what drives the predators down. That then gives respite to the herbivores, and that lowers this term so that the herbivores can grow. So that's your feedbacks. That gives you the oscillations. Okay? Um, so do these equations closely model what you actually can measure in terms of populations, or is it um, chaotic? No, they're pretty good, but they're simplicities, because here, R is a constant. Here, R is a constant. But we just saw that R is actually a function of birth rate and death rate. So these are simple models. Density dependence doesn't really operate this way. In an abstract drag term on this product, density dependence, as Carrie just indicated, is operating on changing the birth rate. When the feedback is crowded, you have fewer babies. So as crowding occurs, birth rate goes down. As crowding occurs, what happens to death rate? It goes up. So R is changing as a function of density. In this model, which captures the descriptive tendency, the selection is not operating really on the variable that, that matters. It's a 
convenient drag term put on just to make the dynamics simple. But since we can write computer code to do it, we can actually put the feedbacks on the variable R itself. And we can do it spatially explicitly so we don't have to treat the universe as homogeneous. We could do it in an area where the water is better than an area that the water is not so good. Okay, and then you can couple those because the animals in the area where the water is good, they're going to have excess babies that are going to migrate into the area to avoid crowding. And they'll probably go into the area where it's not so good because everybody's died. But they too will die there unless conditions get good and float all boats. So when the rainy season comes, then if they happen to emigrate at the right time, they'll make it. Okay, so spatially explicit models capture the reality and the heterogeneity of the landscape. These models assume a homogeneous landscape, a constant level of selection. Okay, so they're toy models, but I just wanted you to understand what the key variables are to give some idea of the dynamics, but then we will relax those assumptions and actually have selection working where it does, which is right here on the birth rates and death rates. So those are the things you measure. How many babies a mommy has? What's the survival prospects of the mommy? What's the survival prospects of the baby? It turns out those are not the same, and they also then feed back into this slow fast and where the investment will take place. Okay? Now, we're probably not going to measure survival, but we'll measure variables that affect survival. What might those be? What's going to affect survival? How much food an animal gets is going to be proportional to its survival. So the approximate factors such as feeding rate is something we can measure in three weeks. We're not going to measure survival in three weeks. You need to do a PhD on this organism to be able to measure survival rates. Okay, so we will use proximate factors that are indicative of these longer range variables which are good predictors of evolutionary success in terms of how many progeny are going to survive carrying genes for those behaviors, for those life history strategies forward. Okay? So that's population ecology. Coupled to population ecology is behavioral ecology. We've already seen that most of the responses that animals are going to make both to other individuals in their own population, to members of other species, and the physical environments are going to be behavioral. The reason is, is that's the first line of defense. That's the quickest way to respond. But we've seen that behavior can be selected for. Being able to run faster than your neighbor will keep you alive longer than your neighbor. So behavioral ecology is the study of how ecology, how environmental features, and those environmental features can be the physical environment and the biotic environment, how ecology via natural selection, which we've talked about, shapes behavior. And the behaviors you can look at are foraging behavior, that's going to affect your diet, your conditioning, your ability to breed, group living, being with other individuals, which is going to affect your ability to stay alive from predators. Because as we've said, you don't have to run faster than a lion, you just have to run faster than your neighbor, but you better have a neighbor. Sociality, the way in which individuals live in groups is going to be varying, some of which will be associated with mating. Do I fight for a mate or do I try to attract a mate? Do I have one mate that I'm faithful to and we jointly invest in the kids? Or do I have many mates to spread my genes faster and let my mate invest in all the kids? So that would be the switch from monogamy to polygyny. Behavior could be aggression. Do I fight for this resource or do I negotiate for this resource by a signaling? And cooperation, do we work together or do I believe in selfishness? Or am I altruistic? Do I forego my own reproduction to help someone else breed? These are all the behaviors that selection is operating on. 
And what's interesting is, again, there's trade-offs there. If I live in groups, that could change the best way in which I can forage because we can hunt in groups as opposed to living alone. If I live in groups, that may increase the likelihood that predators find us, but maybe by being in groups, we can better defend each other against being preyed upon, so it leads to cooperation to reduce our individual per capita risk of dying. So although I've listed these behaviors as independent, I think you see that as you adopt a form of behavior in one of these dimensions, it potentiates or constrains your ability to behave in another one of these dimensions. Okay, so the biologists are going to be throwing these trade-offs in this sphere at you as well. So let's look at some of these. So let's start with foraging, and we'll look at what I call territory economics. In order to model and understand how natural selection is shaping various behaviors, behavioral ecologists break behaviors down into the components that produce benefits and that incur costs. So if we're looking at territory economics, we're looking at it the question, is it ever economic to defend space against other individuals? Now, what are the benefits that come from defending space? If you own space, what do you gain? Resources. Right, but more importantly, you gain exclusive use of those resources, right? So if you have a garden in your backyard, only the deer may share the food with you. You basically have rules in society to keep other human beings out of your garden. So what will you do with the use of those vegetables that you're growing? What's the prudent behavior? Do you collect all the tomatoes on one day? What do you do? Just let them grow uh, until they're ripe. Yeah, you take the reddest ones on day one and you let the orange ones redden and the green ones become orange. You farm it, don't you? Yep. Why? Why do you do that? Because what allows have, you to do that? Do have any competitors. There's no competitors. Now, how did you keep the others out? Using a fence and guns. You build a fence. <laughs> that cost you something, didn't it? It does. You put out a sign, trespasses will be prosecuted. <laughs> you might have a gun to shoot at those trespassers, which means someone else might shoot back at you. So you get this benefit of optimally being able to sample the food at your volition at a cost. And so by owning that resource, you're not compelled to grab all the tomatoes in before your neighbor has to share it with you. In which case, you'd bring all the green ones in and all the red ones in and let the green ones ripen on your windowsill, wouldn't you? But what if you didn't get there fast enough because I'm talking and you meant to go home at 5 o'clock and sample those tomatoes, but you're going to get home at 5.30 and someone else does it. You pay a huge cost, right? of no resources. So when does it pay to take defense of an exclusive area? And when does it not pay? And we can model that, and so I've modeled it up here. So you've got an axis. Area under your control is the x-axis. Small to a large area. And then I've got benefits or costs in some nebulous currency on the y-axis. And I've drawn the b-line with diminishing returns. Why might I have done that? More land is better, but is so much land so much better than the last aliquot that preceded it? But if a line was straight, then a doubling of the area would double my benefits. 
Is that usually the way it works? No. It's usually diminishing returns. So that more is better, but as you add more, the marginal gain goes down. So the first derivative is positive, the second derivative is negative. And that's your diminishing returns. And that's usually what we see when we measure these things in animals. And then I've got my cost curve, the dashed line. And I've made it exponential, but it could be linear. Why did I make it exponential? What justification would I have for doing that? Defending that first little area, does anyone else care? There probably is not even enough soil for one tomato plant. But then I want this much area, and then I want this much area, and then I want the whole room. And each one of you in the room is saying, wait a minute, I don't have any space. And as I displace more and more of you, more and more of you are going to gang up on me. So to get that next marginal increase, I've got to deal with all the failed individuals. So it's very likely that the more space I have to get that next equivalent acre, more and more people are going to push back. So the cost of that next acre is going to be much more expensive than the previous acre. So I did it exponentially. So on that curve, show me where the minimum area is where territoriality is feasible and where it gets too expensive. So I'm going to start sliding the line. You tell me when to stop. Stop, stop. OK, here? No, no. A little bit to the airport. It's actually right here. Because that's where benefits equal cost. At that point, I should defend space. Because whatever I gain from having exclusive use is exactly balanced to the cost of me having that much space. And I should keep defending space until where? Stop. Right. Because that's the next place where benefits and costs are equal. Because past that point, costs are rising faster than benefits. So we've now defined a region where exclusive use of an area is economically viable. And so we've proven that there will be resource space under a set of environmental quality with a set of competitors out there where it pays to defend space. Okay, so we've defined a minimum and a maximum. Where's the optimum? The optimum occurs where we maximize the difference between benefits and costs. Or if we have equations, it's where the marginal value, the slope of the two equations, the lines are equal. So the slope is parallel here and parallel there, which is where costs and benefits are being maximized. The difference are being maximized. So this represents the optimal territory size that animals should shoot for. Because that's where individuals are going to have the maximum gain for the lowest cost. The difference is going to be maximized, which means they're going to be in the best bodily condition. They're going to be able to spread the most genes. So, so you should see a distribution of territories out there that are narrowly focused around that area because selection will favor exactly that size territory. Okay? Now what happens if costs increase? That all of a sudden is an influx of competitors out there. What's going to happen to the optimal territory size? It will decrease. Okay, so the original cost function is here. But the new cost function for each marginal increase goes up faster. And that then shifts the optimum from here to here. And so the optimal territory size shrinks. So we can play these hypothetical games as behavioral ecologists and say, as the environment changes, as the environment degrades, as the number of competitors increases, 
we would predict that animals would live on smaller territories. And so as biologists, we can go out there and look at dry lands, because we can do this equivalently with a constant cost. And what happens if our benefit curve looks like this, and in a harsher environment, the benefit curve looks like that? What's going to be the optimal territory size? In the first one, it's here. In the second one, it's here. Again, as conditions deteriorate, we would predict that the average territory size is going to shrink, and we can predict by how much, depending on the functionality of those relationships. So this is how behavioral ecology through the tools of evolutionary biology look at the change in behavior as environment changes because natural selection is favoring individuals that are maximizing their profit, maximizing the difference between benefits and cost. Very powerful way to get at the optimum behavior. Okay, so this is an optimality approach to understanding why animals do what they do. Um, you can go out and measure it. We can measure by doing experiments. We can cut the lawn of the grass and see how they change. We can lower the benefits. We can measure feeding rate, which I told you is proportional to baby production. So you can go out there with your binoculars and stand there and measure feeding rate for animals that have territories and those that don't. And so you can get the shape of these curves. And then you can make predictions. You can look at the fighting rate on areas of different size. And again, get the shape of these curves and ask, where's the optimum? And is that the average we see out in the wild? OK, so as behaviors, we can get the data to tune the shape of these curves. OK, so it's a very powerful tool for doing what if okay. hypothetical predictions. Yes, question? Yeah. Uh, are biologists sometimes interested in the opposite? So not from the benefit and cost curve to the, to the optimal area, but maybe they want to elicit the preferences of population. So knowing the area... They may want, I, didn't, I didn't hear that. They may want to what? Uh, biologists, um, I'm asking if uh, they may be interested in the opposite process, knowing the area, then reconstruct the benefit and cost curves. So sort of a, a, list, a, a preference solicitation or a utility. That's what, you, that's what you would do. You would look at an animal that has a small territory and ask how much benefit and how much cost does it get? How many fights is it in per hour? What's its feeding rate? Right. And then you might look at one that's in a much bigger territory and see what its costs are and what its benefits are. You would connect the dots for the benefits, you'd connect the dots for the cost, and you would get those curves. Okay, and then you would see if the average, you make a prediction from the cost and benefit curves, what the average territory size should be, the optimal, which is what, if selection is working, it would take a distribution and narrow it because it would winnow out all those that had too big and too small. So the average should have very small distribution around it if selection is working, and that average should be pretty close to the optimum prediction. Okay, so that's empirically how you would do it. What would determine the actual, say, standard deviation that you get at the end or during the process of narrowing it down? What are the factors that... You wouldn't be able to determine that. You would only be able to say that, in fact, the distribution is relatively tight and the distribution clusters around what the prediction is. Okay. Okay? So that's the economics of territoriality. How about living in groups? Why live in groups? We talked about benefits and costs. Uh, excuse me. Uh, regarding the territory size, are people begging the question a bit because we are the model that we are using assumes that the benefits and costs are the same for each uh, for each individual. But if, uh, if in a species in a, if an operation there are there is a wide variability of the strength of the individual, then we should expect that the stronger individual will have a larger benefit. 
course, we can. Right. And, and you, could, you, could, you could build this model with an infinite number of benefit curves and an infinite number of cost curves. And you could predict if you're dominant, what you should do, if you're subordinate, what you should do. I'm making the assumption that for simplicity, they're all basically the same phenotype. But you, but, you did, but you could vary that easily, and you could look at then the distribution. That would give, if you did that, you would then be able to predict not only the average, but the actual variation around that average based on the distribution of phenotypes that you see. How many big, strong animals there are, how many weak animals there are. And that would give you a range of predictions, and that would then give you not one a star, but would give you a distribution of A stars. And then you could test in the previous question, if you did it, what the variation is and measure whether it's also consistent with the level of variation. But for simplicity, I just did it as every individual is equal. But you, it's, you don't have to do that. So now let's look at living in groups. What might be something to do the same model? you need to figure out what the costs are and what the benefits are. What are the benefits for living in groups? You can pro protect bigger territory, probably. Well, we assume they're just moving around in the landscape, so they're, they're not defending territory. You could have group territory, so yeah, a bigger group could defend a bigger territory, but we're assuming they're in a group and they're just wandering, they're nomadic. Protection from predators? Right, okay, so you could be getting benefits from anti-predation, and anti-predation comes in many forms. The first and most obvious is what we call dilution. When you're alone on the landscape, and if the predator gets dinner and dinner is you, you're in. If there's two of you and the predator's gonna get dinner, you've reduced your risk by 50%. It's one over two. If there's three of you, it's one over three. So it, immediately you get dilution one over n. So that the predator is going to get a meal, but at least you dilute out your risk. That's very passive, but it works, and it tends to be real. The other is you could have many eyes, that the more individuals you are, it's easier to detect the predator, and therefore take advanced evasive action. So there's a variety of ways in which, by living in a group, can reduce your personal risk of becoming dinner. Remember, we don't care if the group survives, we care if you survive because selection is working on you versus your neighbor to spread genes into future generations. Now, if on average everybody benefits, that's okay too, but you're, compare, you're caring about yourself and your ability to spread your genes into future generations. So that's one set of benefits, a whole range of, of benefits in anti-predation, and they go up again as the B curve shows, as the numbers in the group go up. Dilution goes up, you know, one over N. What are some of the costs of living in a group? There's only two automatic costs, and there's a lot of ancillary costs. What do you think the two automatic costs are that you can't avoid by living in groups? Competition. Competition is one, and it's usually reproductive competition, but competition is one. And the other is disease and parasite transmission. If you live with neighbors, you get sick with neighbors. Any of you that have children know that as school starts and you put all these kids who come from different areas into the classroom, within a week every kid is sick and then you get sick when they breathe on you because you live with them in home, at home, in a group. So the other automatic cost is increased disease and parasite transmission. So costs go up, and they generally go up disproportionately with increasing group size, whereas benefit shows diminishing returns. So just like in the optimal territory size, we can compute a minimum group size, minimum individuals where groups are going to form, and a maximum number of individuals where groups are going to no longer be disadvantageous. So at this point up here, if I add another individual, costs exceed benefits, you're not going to have groups of that size. And so I put a dotted line that groups will form once you get past that threshold, and groups will not get larger than groups of that size. But where's the optimum? Again, it's where benefits and costs can be maximized, where the difference can be maximized. And that occurs at this point right here, which leads to n star, the optimum group size. 
just like we had the optum territory size. But now we get into some evolutionary biology. And this is where game theory starts to matter. Because is that optimum evolutionarily stable? The answer is no. And to see that, we have to redraw the gross benefits and cost curve, which is shown right here. We have to create what's called a net benefit curve. And that's the lower panel, which is the difference between B minus C. And you can see that the lower bound is right here. And the peak of this curve occurs where benefits and costs are maximally different. That's this point right here. And then as you move up to bigger group sizes, the benefits and costs start to shrink, at least the difference does, until you get to this point here where there are no longer any benefits and costs for being in a group bigger than that. So you have the same optimal group size, N star, but it appears differently. It appears at the peak in the graph. Does everyone understand why that peak is there? Why is it not zero on the left? I'm sorry? Uh, why is it not zero on the left? Um, I've done it because that's one individual. It can't be less. So that one individual gets whatever benefit it gets by not being in the group. Oh, okay. So I just gave it some positive benefits for being alive. It has to have some positive benefit for being alone on the landscape or it would be dead. Okay? And that's because that's the same as this point here where there is some positive benefit, okay? Mm -hmm. But I'm going to change colors now. That is not stable, that optimum, because what happens if I add this individual right here, that red dot? It's not optimum, right? Because why? Why is it not optimum any longer? Why is it not optimum from an evolutionary sense? Would that animal prefer to be in that group or would it prefer to be in the group of N star? What's its fitness? What's its net benefit? There'd be a greater net benefit, right? If it went back to N star, it'd be a greater net benefit, so it would leave more offspring, right? Mm -hmm. So adding that extra individual diminishes every individual's fitness or reproductive success than in the previous condition, if they were all in a group smaller by one. We're making the assumption that all individuals are the same here. But do you see what's happened? And what happens if we had a second individual? What happens to the average per capita net benefit? It goes down again, right? It would much rather be here at the top of the apex. But what choice does it have? If it fights the individual to drive it out, what's it doing to the cost curve? It could also be higher. It's going to make it higher, and that's going to shift the entire N star even smaller. So unless it succeeds in driving it out, it pushes itself further away from the optimum because the peak is going to shift down. So it's probably not going to be selected to be a fighter. What other choice does it have? Why does it leave the group? It's not doing very well out here, but it's doing better than over here by being alone on the landscape. This value is higher than this value. And in fact, individuals will suffer each other to this point. That's called a stable group. It's suboptimal based on traditional optimality theory and its predictions. Because that group is still doing better than at this point here. So the group will form, 
but it's suboptimal because not every individual is maximizing its gain. The maximization of the gain occurs here. But the individual is indifferent between being in that group of n star plus delta, or alpha in this case, I just drew it, as opposed to being alone on the landscape. It's equivalent, so it's indifferent. And that's why that group is stable. We say that group is evolutionarily stable because the individual doesn't do better by being alone. If another individual joined the group down here, what should that individual do? Should that individual stay in the group after it assesses what its feeding rate is? No, we'll leave. It's going to go and live alone because it can do better here than it can here. And hence, this group is stable. It's going to be suboptimal, but it's stable. It won't increase any further. Everyone follow the difference here? This is really important. Well, that's an option too. It could be split in half. But the point is that the stable group size approach governs the dynamics of the behavior that can evolve. In this case, we just did the simple case of comparing it against a solitary group. But even if the group split and pushed it down here, that would also be suboptimal because now it's lower than that. So that group's going to grow, it's going to keep adding members, and then it's going to go over the top and shrink and split again. It doesn't mean it's going to be stable and permanent, it means that number is at least a solution that's evolutionarily stable, but the dynamics could lead to a split, to a growth, to, a sh to an overgrowth, split, and it could go around in a cycle. Okay? So this is really important. This concept is a concept of frequency dependence. That your payoffs are changing based on what the other individuals in the population are doing. Which is where game theory comes in. Because game theory is a type of optimization that doesn't actually give you the best of all worlds, but it gives you the realistic world that's evolutionarily stable given that other players in the population are responding to what you do, and the best response you can do is a function of their response. And the best response that they can get is a function of your response. And so the payoffs are changing based on the relative frequency of what individuals are doing. In this case, the game has two solutions, st solitary versus stable group, stable group of size n plus alpha. Okay. So that leads to this concept of an evolutionarily stable strategy. And we define an evolutionarily stable strategy, John Maynard Smith did, to allow for simplicity to test for it. And it's called a common strategy, when a common strategy can resist invasion by a rare mutant strategy. So it allows you to do local optima stability theory in mathematics, because you're at the optimum and you ask, if you're pushed away from the optimum a little, do you come back to that optimum or do you slide down a slope to an alternative state? And that's what we just did with our stable group size. The other state is solitary. Okay, so that leads to frequency dependence, the payoffs, and that's where game theory comes in. So let's do a game on mating strategies. And the game we'll look at is monogamy versus polygyny. And Gordon Orient's created this graph where your fitness, often called W, is on the y-axis. And territory quality is on the x-axis. And we have a fitness function 
that translate the quality of the territory in the ability to produce babies. And that usually looks something like this. A high quality territory leads to high fitness. And a low quality territory leads to lower fitness. So this is just your fitness function. And this fitness function in this particular case is for a single female on a territory. And let's say that the first female that arrived, they've been, they've been overwintering in Panama, the males have come up early, which is usually the case, and they've duped it out and set up territories, exclusive areas of a certain size, to have insects that are hatching every day, like that the fly fisherman tries to copy. So it's a continuously producing resource. And some males get the good spaces, and some males get the bad spaces, and some males get no spaces at all. And then the females fly up, and they're asynchronously arriving. The first female comes, and she's shrewd and clever, and she flies around the swamp, and she goes, you know what? That's my space. I am his mate. And her fitness is going to be here. And the second female comes, I didn't draw this very well, let me fix this. So she comes onto the territory, and she lands here on a territory of that quality. And her fitness is a little bit lower than the first female to arrive. And the third female lands there, and the fourth female lands there, and the fifth female lands there, and the sixth female lands there. Right? And you're going to have the variation in fertility of the various females. But what if those females said, you know what, this female here, this sucks being way down there. I'm going back and I'm going to parasitize the best territory. And I'm going to let that female kick me out if she so chooses. There's plenty of insects on that male's territory. Well, that generates a second fitness curve. Nested below, it's a fitness curve for females that inadvertently have to share their food. So the first female, all of a sudden, is parasitized. And they both have that fitness. So what's the first female's option? She has two options. What are those options? Stay or go to a place where yeah, she could stay and try to drive that female away, but now she's got eggs and babies she's feeding. And if she spends time fighting, what's going to happen to those babies? They're going to die. So she's probably not going to incur the cost of fighting. So she has really two options then. One is stay and put up with the sharing of those insects. Or leave and go down to here. She can do that? No. No, because down there is what drove the female that was down there to be bigamous. So bigamy is better than going way down there. And the next female to arrive might say that space is available, but I'm going to be bigamous on the second best territory. And the third female may say I'm going to be bigamous on that territory. Now, the fitness of that female is equivalent to the fitness of the fourth ranked female that's living alone. Those two fitnesses are equal. So the fourth female is here. Should she be 
bigamous with the male on that territory? No, because she's already there. But you could imagine, she could also say, you know what? I am going to go to that best territory and be trigamous with that male. Should she be not monogamous on this territory of quality rank one, two, three, four? Or should she be the trigamous female on territory rank one? You tell me. Better stay, stay, stay two, three, four. Right. So this indifference curve drives her decision. She's not going to go here because her fitness is going to be below what she's doing here. This curve is called the polygyny threshold. And demonstrates that your options depend on what the behaviors of other animals are. So th there's no one best strategy. What are you going to see in this population? You're going to see a mi mixture of polygyny and monogamy. And it's going to vary depending on when you arrive, what options you have. So let's go and look at game theory and frequency dependence with the evolution of aggression. And this is usually done in what we call the hawk-dove game. We start out with a world of everybody living in the Garden of Eden. And no one's eaten the apple yet, so no one does bad behavior. And so the only strategy available for all these animals is dove. And dove are always nice guys, and they always settle contests over limited resources by a tactical convention. Real animals settle it by signaling. They display, and they settle the convention. But we're going to do it by a fair coin flip. Heads, it's mine. Tails, it's yours. 50-50. So they get together, there's a dollar bill on the table, and one of them takes out a quarter and goes, heads or tails? Heads, you win. Tails, I win. They flip it, they agree to that convention, the heads guy gets it, goes away. So what's going to happen over time if this is repeated many, many times? It's a fair coin. They split the pie half. Yeah, the payoff to animals playing dove is going to be whatever the value of the resource is, it was a dollar bill, divided by two, right? So we're going to ask this question, is the dove strategy an ESS? What's the definition of an ESS? Evolutionarily stable strategy. Quick, quick. Uh, pay when, off common, the when common can resist invasion by any other strategy. How are we going to measure your ability to resist invasion? It's not do you duke it out. It's is your payoff higher than the payoff from the other strategy? When that strategy first appears and is rare, why is that an evolutionarily stable strategy? Because when I'm common, it may not be the best optimum strategy, never is, but when it's common and we're all playing it, on average, we do better than the invader, the first mutant that plays something else. So that invader can't pick up steam, will have fewer babies than we on average are doing, and so our population of doves stays common and drives to extinction the mute. Does everyone see that? Mm -hmm. So that's how we'll tell an ESS. And if the only strategy out there in Nirvana, in the Garden of Eden, is dove, then we look at the payoff to a dove over here. Payoffs are over on this side. When a dove plays another dove, and it's V over 2. The expectation is V over 2. Now, let's say there's a mutant that appears. And the mutant, let's go back, let's define our mutant, is Hawk. And Hawk always escalates. 
It's a totally unreasonable character. It completely ignores the convention of flipping a coin. So when a hawk and a dove get together, the dove pulls the quarter out of its pocket, gets ready to flip it, and what's the hawk done? The hawk's grabbed the dollar bill. Has the hawk had to fight? Nope. Nope, because the dove doesn't know what fighting is. But the hawk is prepared to fight if challenged. What it's doing is disobeying the convention. It grabs the resource before the coin is flipped, and it will ignore the coin flip anyway if the coin flip had taken place. So that's the rare mutant strategy. Grab the food, grab the resource, and always fight and escalate if challenged. Disregard the convention. In other words, the mutation took away a memorization or an understanding of what the social convention was. So we now put a hawk on our landscape. And when the hawk is rare, who's the hawk going to interact with? When, it's, when it is the one mutant hawk, who's it going to interact with? Doves. Doves. And what did it get when it met the first dove, and the second dove, and the third dove, and the fourth dove? What does it get every single time? V. V. And what does the dove get whenever it meets a hawk? Zero. Zero. So, what's the definition of an ESS? Can the dove can the dove resist invasion by the hawk? Nope. No, because the hawk gets V in a world of doves. So V is greater than V over 2. So we can prove that dove is never an ESS. Being nice, always, is never evolutionarily stable. But is being nasty, always, evolutionarily stable? What's missing in our game? What happens to the hawk hawk? Right, because... The doves still are numerically dominant, but they're not reproducing per capita as many replicates of doves as the hawk is. So very quickly, the hawk starts interacting with other hawks. And what's the payoff when a hawk meets another hawk if they're all exactly the same? The over and there's a cost to fighting. V over two minus the cost of fighting. Yeah, it's going to be, each fight's going to have, remember we saw competition is negative, negative, so it's actually going to be V minus D, each player is going to have to pay some sort of damage cost. Divided by two. If the value of the resource is greater than the cost of damage, is Hawk an ASS? No. Nope. Yes or no? No. If there is no damage cost, is it in ASS? Oh, no damage. No damage. If, if fighting was free, is it in ASS? Yes. It's yes. a trick question. This is a trick question. If D was zero, is Hawk in ESS? Can it resist invasion by a dove? Yes. Yes. No. Because they're both equal. They're V over two. They're equivalent. So, so the population will just oscillate around. But if there is a damage cost, then Hawk is never going to be an ESS because V minus D is always going to be smaller than V. So when Hawks are common, can a dove and V? If D is greater than V. If D greater than V is Hawk and ESS. No. Okay? So, what's the solution to this game? Is there an optimum, an evolutionarily stable mixture that is stable? Like our stable group size? The answer is yes. If P equals the fraction of hawks in the population, hawks, then we can figure out 
the expected reward or fitness of Hawk, which is going to be a function of P times the expected payoff when a Hawk meets a Hawk, plus 1 minus P of the time a Hawk is going to meet a Dove. The expected payoff to a Hawk when it meets a Dove. And the fitness of a dove is going to be p, the fraction of times when a dove meets a hawk. So it's the expected payoff when a dove meets a hawk, plus 1 minus p of the time, the expectation when a dove meets a dove. Now we plug these terms in, what's the expectation when a dove meets a dove? It's V over 2. What's the expectation when a dove meets a hawk? It's 0. What's the expectation when a hawk meets a hawk? It's going to be P times V minus D over 2. And the expectation when a hawk meets a dove? It's going to be 1 minus P times V. And then you solve for P, I'm out of space, and when you do that, it's V over D. Okay. That's the fraction of hawks in the population. So as D goes up, what happens to the fraction of hawks? What happens? It goes down. So as the cost of fighting goes up, the frequency of fighting goes down. Or the proportion of individuals that are fighters in the population goes down. Manny Smith showed that this, what's called a mixed DSS, because neither pure strategy is an ESS, this mixed DSS can come about either because individuals have fixed behaviors and the population consists of P fraction that are hawks and P and one minus P fraction that are doves, or individuals have both behaviors and they play them P of the time hawk, one minus P of the time dove, but, and this is the key, they switch between the behaviors randomly. They're equivalent. So does everyone see how the frequency dependence is operating here? That the costs are changing based on the fraction P. And there's an equilibrium point, a mixture, where hawks and doves will both exist in the population, or hawkish and dovish tendencies will be mixed inside individuals comprising that population. And the optimum is that fraction. It doesn't say, if, if damage is twice as costly, if, if V is 100 and damage is 200, it says the optimum mixture is 50-50. If you saw 80-20, that would not be optimum. And that's called the mixed DSS. But these are pretty dumb animals, aren't they? They're switching behaviors with no assessment. They're flipping like they have a roulette wheel or a little spinner in their head. And each time they come to that dollar bill, their roulette wheel says if it's 50-50, if you're on red when the spinner lands, or on blue, you choose either hawk or dove. And that will give you the best payoff per individual. Any other mixture is less good. And you can do that by just computing those mixtures in these formula and you would see that that's the case. But we can ask the question, can dumbness be selected against in the population? Hi guys. Can dumbness be selected against in the population? Can assessment evolve? In other words, can we have a conditional strategy that the conditional strategy is pure? Bye-bye, guys. Okay? So you can condition or make a contingent on some factor of the phenotype. 
So let's say the conditional strategy in assessment is you play hawk if you're the larger individual and you play dove if you're the smaller individual. Does that seem reasonable? If you're big and strong, you're willing to take on the cost of fighting. And if you're small and wimpy, you play by the tactical convention of, we'll flip a coin. Thank you very much. Now there's some assumptions there. One is that the assessment is perfect. When I look at you, I know that I am bigger than you or you are bigger than me. Is that always going to be the case? Is that, is that always going to be the case? In the winter, in the summer it might be when you're wearing bathing suits. But in the winter when you're putting on big down jackets, are you always going to get size right? Yes or no? No. So that's, we're making the assumption that assessment is perfect, and it probably isn't always perfect. The second one is that the prediction from size is perfect. That the big animal always will win and the small animal will always lose. Do you think that's always true? If you're really hungry, you might say, I don't care if I'm small. I need that food. And if you're really big, you might say, you know, I've eaten five meals today because I bossed five other individuals around. If he really wants that food, he can have that food. So we're only looking at one asymmetry here, and that's body size. But there is another asymmetry, and I've done the mathematics on this, of resource valuation, and they interact. Generally, dominant individuals don't value resources very highly and subordinate individuals value resources very highly. So they interact in a funny way, and that makes the mathematics a little bit trickier. But for now, we're gonna make the assumption that size is a pretty good, if not perfect, predictor of who's gonna win. And we're making the, assess the assumption that there's no cost to assessment. That I can just look at you and instantaneously know you're big or small, and that's sufficient. In the real world, you sometimes have to pick and probe to find out whether someone is big or small. Make them display, and so there's certainly a time cost. But this very simple model, this extension, is going to assume perfect assessment, perfect prediction, and no cost. Okay, so I put those assumptions up here. In blue is the traditional hawk-dove game. Fixed strategies. Pay off to a hawk, pay off to a dove when they meet each other. But I've added in red the optimal assessor strategy both in the row and the column. So what happens when an assessor meets a hawk? What's the payoff? Why is it V over 2? Why is it V over 2? When you play hawk and you're bigger, what happens? You win. You win, so you get V. And you play hawk and you're smaller, what do you do? You play dove and you get zero. V plus zero over two is V over two. Right? You're assessing. You're never going to make a mistake. When I know I'm going to win, I'm going to play hawk. I'm going to steal the money. And when I know I'm smaller, I know I'm going to lose, so I'm just going to play by the tactical convention and take my zero. What happens when an assessor meets a dove? When it's bigger, what does it get? V. And when it's smaller, what does it get? V over two. What's the average? Three quarter V. What happens when an assessor meets another assessor? They both are playing by the same rules. They each know which is bigger and loser, so when the bigger one gets play hawk and gets the resource, the loser one plays dove and gets the zero, so again, it's V over two. So that's gonna be the benchmark that we're gonna compare whether assessor is an evolutionarily stable strategy. 
whether smart guys, if we're at the optimum of smart guys, can dumb hawks and dumb doves invade? Well, that's going to depend on the payoff when a hawk meets an assessor, which is going to be v minus d over 2. Because what's the hawk doing? It's dumb. It's going to fight even when it's smaller, right? It's blind. It has to play hawk. And the assessor plays hawk, and it's going to win because it's big. So the hawk is going to lose. And what about dove when it meets an assessor? It's always going to get, half the time it's going to get v over 2, and half the time it's going to get 0. So it's going to get v over 4. So this term is bigger than this term, is bigger than this term. And so the optimal assessor is an ESS under those assumptions. And they're not bad assumptions. But it shows you that a conditional strategy, a strategy conditioned on phenotype can dominate a mixed ESS. There's other conditional strategies in the literature, like bourgeois. That's the owner. If I'm owner, I win. If I'm an interloper, I lose. That's the bourgeois strategy. That also can be an ESS and dominate the hawk dove game. So there's a whole series of conditional ones. But I wanted to take one that's interesting and important, which is the evolution of assessment and knowledge. Smart animals can beat dumb animals, as long as these conditions hold. So the last point I want to talk about before I go is can cooperation evolve? And here's another game. It's from The Prisoner's Dilemma. You know the story that these two guys go rob a bank, they bury the money, and they get arrested by the police. And they make a pact to cooperate. And the cooperation is do not talk to the police and give anything away. And if we do that, they can't indict us, and we're going to go free, and we'll go get the six dollars, six thousand dollars that we stashed, and we'll each get three thousand. Okay, by cooperating, they get the reward. But what are the police going to do? They're going to put them in separate rooms, and they're going to grill them, and they're going to tempt them. Turn your other guy in and we'll give you $5,000. What do you do? If you rat on your other guy and he doesn't rat on you, he's a sucker. He gets nothing and goes to jail. If you each rat on each other, you don't do very well either. And different games have this set at zero or slightly positive, and the dynamics are a little bit different. In a one-shot game, what do you do? You always defect. You always defect, and what happens? You always get this. Not optimal, is it? But what if you have a repeated game? like we saw in Hawk Dub over and over and over and over again. And a bunch of evolutionary biologists were asked um, by Axelrod and Hamilton to submit hypothetical games and let the computer play repeated games. And one of them was tit for tat, which basically said, always start out as a cooperator. And then, from that point on, copy your partner's behavior. If your partner defects, you defect. And if your partner switches back to cooperate, you instantly forgive and copy his behavior again. So no punishment. And it turns out that that strategy is an ESS in that repeated game. And that leads to the evolution of cooperation, not to temptation. But it requires that the game be repeated. And why does it require that the game be repeated? Because you're punishing your partner's behavior, but you instantly forgive and come back to cooperation.
And experiments were done in fish tanks. Manfred Molinsky did some experiments where he set up a fish tank and he put a big predatory fish here behind glass and he put two tiny fish, put one tiny fish right here. And he then put two mirrors in this tank over here. One mirror was called the cooperating mirror. The mirror was put like this. Fish at a distance don't have reliable information about whether this fish is a predator or not. How do you get that reliable information? What do you do when you want to find out something? You creep forward, you move your head around, right? So how do you get reliable information? You move closer. Now what does this fish see when it's moving closer? It's seeing its image move closer. That's the cooperating mirror. And then he put a defecting mirror on an angle like that. And he put the fish in here. And then the fish inch closer. What does it see in that mirror that's angled at 45 degrees? Right away. It sees its image shrinking. It sees its image shrinking, which it perceives as going away. Which mirror let the fish get the joint information by getting close enough to discern the predator? That that fish was big. The cooperating mirror or the defecting mirror? In other words, if you, if you plotted number of time steps and distance to the predator, you got two lines. This was the defecting and this was the cooperating mirror. They got closer with the cooperating mirror. If they saw their image coming with them, they lasted longer and got closer and got better information. And what that means, this game works because T is greater than R is greater than P is greater than S. And this game actually structures with those mirrors and the quality information and the risk payoffs that match that ratio. So the cooperating mirror is duplicating behavior in this cell. The defecting mirror is this cell, these two cells. Okay? So again, it's game theory, and because it's repeated, you start to see that the payoff is being driven by the actions that your partner is taking. And so much of what we're going to see on those African landscapes are driven not solely by those physical factors, not solely by the existence of competitors and mutualists as if they're playing separate games for the optima, but as a function of what the other players in the population are doing. And so that's where these different approaches to understanding what's optimum and what hence is an adaptation that selection is favoring varies depending on how complicated and realistic we want to make the problem. Okay. So the biologists in the class are going to be arguing we need to look at this because. We need to look at this because we want to measure the optimum solution to this problem. 
Your job is to ask them which optima, why are we measuring that, what are the important actions and reactions if necessary that we have to count for when we're trying to fully understand how to construct the model and make the predictions so we can test them with our observations.